I'd like to welcome everybody to this live stream event. I'm enormously happy to be able to host this conversation today, and particularly happy because I'm doing it with, a, with an old friend. Um, just as an introduction, and, and I'll go into who, who we are, these talks happen in the context of, of, what, of what we do. So, so I started B Sharp. I used to be a Fortune 500 CFO, and I stopped doing that to jump and do my and follow my true passion, which is helping others grow, just like I was helped, just like most people who get to, to the C suite in, in these positions, you know, do we, we get help. And so the intention here is to help you by understanding what others have done, what their learnings have been, what their stories have been, what's the human behind the story, behind the title, behind the level. And, and so that's why I set up a V Sharp and that's how we ended up in this conversation where, like I said before, I'm honored by having my good friend, Don Hertz, uh, who joins us today. Um, he and I met in Amsterdam when I was living there, uh, working with Phillips and uh, we were neighbors and we happened to meet one day uh, for for a few drinks and snacks. And then we uh, partook in a couple of uh, barbecue events where either he or I were barbecuing something. And so the smells would waft over the fence and that's how we became fast friends. And ever since we've, we've been in touch. Uh, Ton has a very accomplished career. I'm gonna let him talk uh, about what he's done, but essentially uh, 23 years uh, he started in, in DSM as legal counsel and then moved up more to support the business. Um, he ran operations internationally from there, Axon Nobel, from there to Beckard. All of these are world leading companies in, in what they do. So um, after that, or in concurrence with, uh, with his executive work at, uh, at, at Beckard, and I, you will probably correct me at some point here, uh, Tom, but maybe even with, with Axo, you started working concurrently with the Solidaridad Network as part of the of the board and um, and Ton did a fantastic job so much so that he multiplied the membership of that organization by if I'm not incorrect more than 30 times its size so I'm going to let Ton tell us about that and uh, before I stop and give him the microphone I'd like to also say that um, not only has he accomplished a lot in the professional space He's also a very uh, human, successful uh, pater familias. He, he has a beautiful family. I have uh, the fortune of knowing uh, two excellent kids, a uh, beautiful wife, and uh, they have one of the most precious relationships that I've seen in a family of, uh, of successful individuals. So with that, Tan, over to you. Welcome, and again, thank you for agreeing to, to join us. Thank you, Eduardo. Far too many beautiful words, I would say. In the course of the hour, everybody will find out how human we are, how many mistakes we make, and uh, that we learn from these mistakes. Um, it's a pleasure, indeed, to reunite with you. Uh, indeed, we were passionate neighbors on the barbecue, but also liked each other's families. Um, I saw your life in Philips. You saw my life in Axel Nobel in those years. Um, and we also spoke a lot about how relative these uh, high-ranking positions are uh, and with what complications it also comes. And I think we both made turns in our life that not only sea level is the holy grail, but there are other things in life. Uh, we filled this in each in our own way. Solidaridad was for me indeed a, uh, eight years in the board where we could bring and help that organization to go from to a total of 1,100 employees, and indeed uh, from less than 10 to uh, more than sixfold uh, millions per year of subsidized work for the smallholders in the world, with huge commodities for the Unilevers, Nestle's, Friesland Copinas of this life. Um, we should not underestimate that on the 8 billion people we have nowadays on our planet, uh, at least two and a half to three billion are smallholders, which we sometimes seem to forget if we go to the retail store in the Netherlands or in the West and we just take something from the shelf. And that is where my passion for Solidaridad came from, for a meaningful life 
of the smallholders. Um, but I think very rewarding has been the last four years in my career. Where I uh, was really formally even employed and still employed by the University of Maastricht um, that allowed me to do much more with students and to be in a kind of what we call helix between academia, the business world, governmental bodies, but to be a lot amongst the young generation, the young people uh, that are very much looking forward, not only to a successful career, but to a meaningful life. Uh, and I think that's a, a theme that resonates well nowadays. Thanks, Eduardo. Ab absolutely, I, I, I fully agree. And, and that's one of the things that I uh, mistakenly omitted mentioning that I, I, I admire that you do, which is the, the, let's say academic collaborations where you're sharing a lot of what you know uh, with, with universities. We'll get to that uh, question at some point, but it would also be interesting when we get to it uh, that you describe a little bit what you do with uh, BISCI basically. And um, that's uh, all within the realm of what you've been doing for so many years, sustainability. Let, let me ask you a question, Ton. As, as our careers develop, so when we start, we oftentimes see ourselves doing something. And as life goes on, we wind up in different places. We end up doing things that are different from, from, from what we thought. I know that I, I'm a... I'm an electronics engineer, a computer science major. I always thought I would have a software development firm. And uh, some years later, I was CFO in Fortune 500 companies. So we never know. Where, where did you see yourself when you started? What, what was your initial perception of what your career was going to be? Oh, that's a while back. Huh? Um, I'm turning 62, end of September. Um, but once in a lifetime, I, uh, I had a best of us. degree. And... Uh, I knew when I became a law student um, that I didn't want to be a, a, the classical attorney or the classical judge, but I wanted to be somehow in the business as, that, as in those days we called it. So it was a very practical step to then become a legal counsel. Um, and the professors that I, was, that I was asking my advice was one was working as an advisor for Philips and the other one for DSM. And I found out that uh, Philips had uh, a lot of lawyers and also a lot of bright people in Brussels to almost guide Brussels to develop the right guidelines that would fit Philips of those days. And there were only 15 lawyers in DSM. And speaking to one of those lawyers in DSM, I could feel that their entrepreneurial spirit by building a company out of the coal mines into chemistry, to fine chemicals, uh, into the pharmaceutical active ingredients were, uh, that I would like this. So I was just a lucky guy that they would love to hire me. And when I started my career, because that was your question, I was a happy trooper that I was as a legal counsel immediately asked to join the business and to open up a sales office in Budapest to help them with material contracts. I'm very proud still to say that in the 90s of last century, we made an eight year agreement with Coca-Cola for, for the, for the suite of aspartame. Uh, so to be at the headquarters of Coca-Cola in Atlanta at Coca-Cola Plaza number one, when you're 26 years old, then, then you mm. think you have a serious job. Um, but it was then for some years that it gave me a lot of satisfaction. And in those years as a legal counsel, I traveled so much with the business leaders of DSM that step by step, I got the smell of business in my nose. I, I would dare say that maybe, maybe you got the job and the ticket to get on that plane because you either expressed an interest in uh, getting closer to the actual business or because they saw an aptitude in you or because of both. What would be your thoughts? So how, how did you end up getting um, an offer that said, hey, Ton, we have this. Would you like to take it? Or, you know, how, how did you end up getting offered more of a business role? Yeah. Did you express? An you never, you never, this, is, this is a very good question, but, uh, but the, honor, the, the, the answer is, is, I can only say that I, uh, I was really... I liked my job, but I liked to think like business people think. So if I would help them with an eight year sales agreement, if I would help them being in the due diligence team of an acquisition, I would try to think as a business person. Um, 
Now, th this is this is an old, uh, a story of an old fox almost, but I worked at the bakery when I was a child. I had a, I was a newspaper boy. I was normally used to deliver what I promise. I wasn't much in the academic side of the legal counseling. I wouldn't say to a business guy, uh, the court of the High Court of Justice has an opinion, and there is also two types of jurisprudence on this. I would normally say this is the solution if you have this problem. And probably the people from the business started to see, hey, this guy could also work at the other side of the table. He could be one of us instead of he is the, the legal counsel. And the more that I was engaged in, in the deal making, I, I thought, well, it, how fascinating is it if you can be the deal maker instead of the supporting function to the deal making? And I think that enthusiasm or that kind of uh, yeah, hunger of a 30 year old, 32 year old, they must have felt. And this is how this uh, has happened. Thank you. That's that's exciting. And I, I guess, uh, like we were saying, the, the, you start your professional life with a plan, and then, then you get closer to reality, and then things happen. You got the smell of business. Uh, you got into conversations where you said, well, it's not useful for me to cite articles and jurisprudence and all of that. I should be talking about what this means for the business. That's an aptitude in, in and of itself. And uh, would you agree that this is a, an actual skill that we need to be able to, regardless of our discipline, translate what we know into what it means for the other side of the table, the business or your customer or the rest of your organization. I think that that's what you're describing. Would that be a fair summarization well, uh, here? Yeah, I think what you say in, uh, in general is, uh, can you put yourselves in the shoes of the person that you're helping? It can be your client, it can be your superior, it can be your colleague, it can be a younger person. But what is meaningful? How does success look like for the persons that you work with? Um, exactly. There are people that stay lifetime in the profession they grew up with. And that is also something to be uh, very proud of. My mentor as a legal counsel, he did his whole life. He was one of the top counsels of the other, but he loves his legal part of it. And he didn't, and, and, but he saw it happening that a few of his colleagues, I was not the only one, chose the side of the business. But you have to have a mentality that you constantly see a glass half full and not half empty. You have to see opportunities. You constantly have to think, uh, what more could we do? And I honestly did not realize this, uh, but for instance, when we did an acquisition in the Netherlands, in iodine derivatives and quinines, we also ended up in a joint venture with a Basque family in Chile producing iodine in the Atacama Desert. Now, when I was doing that joint venture agreement, when I had my red wine with uh, Don Luis, when I was meeting the, the whole family in a late dinner, I was not constantly thinking that I was the business guy or the lawyer. But two, three years later, the chance came up uh, and, and there was also uh, a dilemma in, in corporate DSM. Yeah, and then the people in Chile said, we still remember that that younger guy that was here would probably fit well to us. Later, now being where I am, I could say this very formal, that it makes sense to watch your integrity, to be who you are. The Scottish call this a straight shooter, a spade is a spade. Uh, don't fool around. Don't talk things that are nonsense, because it is ultimately your reputation why they start asking you to do things. And when you're young, you don't call it your reputation, but if you get older, and, and we all have lived lives that companies do well, companies do less, companies get new sea level people, you're popular, and a year thereafter, you're not popular. But what stays with you and what nobody can take away from you is your reputation. You, you, you are and you resonate in society or where you are, You're kind of your personal brand, smaller or bigger. But if you stay to who you are, that normally is a li lifetime lasting kind of personal brand of yours. Uh, but as said, I now articulate this. I didn't say this when I was 30. Indeed, but but that's also uh, something that I've seen 
in, in all of the successful people that I've met is they first and foremost manage to stay true to who they are, good or bad. Uh, you know, it, they are who they are. And that integrity, I think, uh, is definitely what, what makes it different. So, Ton, I, I'm curious, as you started, what was, so you, you started as counsel, then you started getting closer to the actual business. What was your thought process as you were going? Did you develop your view for the longer term and where you wanted a career to go early on? Or was it more you took a step and you saw two steps ahead, one more step, two steps ahead? Did it evolve? Did it evolve, I'm sorry, as you grew? What, how, how did your vision... Uh, you see you already, be, before your sentence is finished, I start thinking and smiling a little bit. No, I do not believe that, that I had a plan for life. I still recall, and people may say, God, uh, uh, he's getting older, old fashioned, but I was proud as the old news, as the former newspaper boy, that I had a Burberry raincoat and I looked like a businessman when I started as a young counsel. I see myself walking into the front door of the old headquarters of DSM. Making that step that they then asked me to become the purchase director when I was 32 for DSM Fine Chemicals uh, and that we could grow that business uh, from 100 to 500 million and that I was part of that management team's engine that, that developed over time and that I, I, I recall clearly that I was up to my ears in the acquisition team to, to purchase a subsidiary of the Austrian ÖMV. I was already talking at home to my wife, we will move to Austria and in the bus to Vienna, uh, the, the, the number one business president says, Hotel, I have other plans for you. Uh, you still remember the, fa the family in Chile? You would do the company a favor if you go there and uh, quadruple that business for me. And of course I had my conditions and, I, and my wishes, but it, 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 so I didn't go to Austria. I, I was flying all over the planet. Uh, digging iodine in, in Chile, but selling <laughs> iodine derivatives to the pharma industry, the food industry, the feed industry, and the x-ray business. And, and, I, and I got a complete different life. Uh, I think if I now look back, and, and even if you are 60 and you apply for a new role, people ask you, can you explain your life? Then, I, then I've always liked a little bit to do something that doesn't look so easy. Um, right. If we go later in the interview, uh, when they asked me to, 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 to start building the internet capabilities for DSM, at the age of 39, so the year 1999, I had a fountain pen in my, in my pocket and I could dictate in a dictate machine because I was a former lawyer. I didn't have a personal computer at home even, let alone that I enjoyed knowing what the internet could do, which we all know now. But one, yeah. on a, one anecdote, in the business I was in, I saw elderly executives changing complete departments and the organization of a company mm -hmm. without understanding the IT component of it. So I said to my wife, I better accept the position in the internet because maybe I will learn so much about digitization that it helps me the rest of my life. I, and this happened to me several times in my life. I was allowed to do things that you normally better don't do. <laughs> uh, now, the last anecdote, when I was a child and I would get, come home after school, primary school, and I didn't like to do my homework. And I, and I said to my mom, I don't want to do this. And she would say in a, in a dialect in Holland, in Netherlands, but I will translate it into English, Tony, because Tony is a small Tony cannot is on the graveyards. That's for people with six pieces of wood around them. So cannot, and I don't want to do my homework, doesn't exist. Here is your cookie and your lemonade. Now you go up and do your homework. So this cannot is on the graveyard became an expression that I've used regularly in my life when as a team or as a company or, or to myself, if I saw a hurdle and I said, damn it, it will work let's cut the elephant into pieces we will make it happen so and cannot is on the graveyard you can express in several languages everybody understands the six pieces of wood 
I, I, I think, Tom, thank you for, for sharing that. I, I think that in what you just said, there's so much to unpack that's meaningful and that's profound. So first is the opportunities that you see. They, I, I believe everybody will have opportunities along their life, along their career. It's our choice whether to take them, whether or not to take them. They're, they will probably be difficult or many of them will probably be difficult or significantly challenging. It's our choice whether we think we can do it or we dare to do it or not. And, and that goes to one of the things that I believe really make a difference in people's lives and in people's careers, which is the mindset. So the belief that you can do things, the belief that you can take on a challenge that's big and hairy and that you're going to give it your best. That's the, that's the difference that I would see, right? I, I, in my own personal humble case, I work with people over my career who were so smart, a lot smarter than I was, but the difference is they probably not all of them believed they could do it and they didn't. And whereas when you believe that you can do it, there's nothing that stops you. Then that's how you end up getting to where you got. That, that would be, I, I, I believe, the other takeaway in this whole inspiring story about what your, what your mom told you, right? So, you know, cannot is, uh, is what's going to be written on your grave or the equivalent of that. You can. And you, and you decided to do it. And that's how you ended up doing these things that I bet for that young lawyer would have been scary. If somebody, the first day you walked through the door of DSM had told you, of DSM had told you, hey, you're going to go to Chile and you're going to start a business for us and you're going to make it four times as big as what it is. Yeah, that probably would have been pretty daunting at that time. But when the chance came, you were ready and you were, and you dared to do it. I think that's very important. It allowed them to make, to make it, I think, all uh, human or, 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 or very, I hope, easy to understand. Um, I think what I learned at a young age uh, because why did I study law? Because I was just not good enough at mathematics. And, and there were a few things in life I couldn't study, so I better study law. Then I studied law and I thought, yeah, but I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm not a real one, at least. I'm going to do business. And then you go into a chemical business and then you think, yeah, I better learn something about the chemical system uh, because I have to understand chemistry. And then, and then you move to coatings and you have to learn formulation technology of paint. And then you go into the vitamins business before that, by the way, and you have to understand the, the, the food complexity. And, and, then, and then you go to a metallurgic company and you have to understand how steel is made because even that is a batch process and 10 times more complex than I thought it was. But I think, although it sounds contradictionary, but I had a good friend, he's still my friend, he is 10 years younger. And he always made a joke about me. He said, you understand hardly anything you do. <laughs> but, you see, you, but you seem to be able to get people around you that together know what they do. And you seem to be finding a way that they work together. And I think it has almost been a privilege in my life that I never was really the specialist of something, unless you call the first five, six years as a lawyer a specialism. But after that, I had to find my way but sometimes it helps if you don't understand the details. Then you're understanding, you can see the, the, the tech line, you see the red line, you can connect dots that others were told even when they studied, don't connect those dots. We have done that before, it doesn't work. And if you don't understand the details always, yeah, you are you are allowed to ask what I always, could. let me ask a stupid question and then I could ask what I wanted. It's almost an act. But I think if I make it more formal, the same friend who worked with me in various spots in my career, he said, Tom, it seems if you run into a bunch of people that play free jazz, that, uh, that, that after a while, you have everybody given the right instrument that they love. So you don't put somebody that plays the flute, the flute uh, uh, to the drums. But you can move free jazz to the ninth of Beethoven. That's the weird thing about you, he said. And I only by now start realizing there is some truth in it. Although uh, when I was doing it in the heat of the job, I often didn't see it. It just happened. I, I think that uh, that's, that's one of the keys is 
when you realize that you don't do it all yourself, that you rely on a team, that you're not necessarily obliged to be the smartest person in the room, that you just need to be smart enough to know who you need and to know how to inspire them and to know how to make them feel great about what they do. That's real art. When you take somebody who can play an instrument and you, and you get them in there and they start with jazz and then you take them all the way up to the ninth of Beethoven or the other way around. I think that uh, that's, that's a key skill. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that I, I've also seen is, I haven't seen anybody who got to the C-suite or to the top of their job locally or regionally or company-wide on their own. It was always because they were able to put a team around them that was very, very capable and that they managed to inspire. And, and so I think that that's, that's something that you did really well. Uh, Ton, let me ask you something in, in, in that regard. You, you were also part of other people's teams as you were growing up. And to this day, you are part of a team. When you were growing up, did you ever get frustrated that you were not growing fast enough or that you, not, you were not growing in the direction that you wanted? How was your journey there? Was it always smooth sailing or was it like mine where all of a sudden at some point you might have felt stalled or a little bit like, what the heck? I should be moving faster. Does that ever happen to you? And how did you handle it? Of course. Oh, I think uh, because the question earlier was whether I had a straight plan. The answer is no. Um, I was a happy trooper as a, law, as a legal counsel. And then the next phase came and the next phase, it all happened. Uh, but I know people and both gentlemen are now the CEO of multinationals. When I got to know them when they were young. They would just say, I'm now in sales, but give it 20 years, I'm, I'm C-level. And in 25 years, I'm the CEO. Also possible, also a style, no. Um, I think uh, if you move in the chemical industry and you go as a legal counsel into the business, you must accept, or any other example that you choose, you must accept that you now and then make a sidestep or that the established top executive management, if there are 12 of them, and they unanimously have to approve your next steps, that one out of those 12 can hesitate and that that gives you a fallback of another year. Um, that you then have to prove again uh, that, that you're mm -hmm. worth the steps that you do. So I do not believe um, that all these things go, go by itself. Uh, it also happened to me, uh, but then I was already older. I had served in Axo Nobel the, 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 the years of the, the, the disinvestments of assets, but also the acquisition of ICI. And it all went well. We, we, we got through the, the Lehman Brothers crisis. But at a certain moment in 2011, there was another crisis coming. And the CEO... Uh, was asking me whether I could think of a, call it savings cost optimization program of half a billion. I said, yes, we made it for him. And then he said, you know, you know what, on a Friday afternoon, I think we're, we're going to ask you this, to do this. Four weeks later, he called me again and he said, you know what, Don, you can't do it. We can't make you, we can't change you out of the job that you fulfill for the company. So if you really want to serve the company well, you have to keep doing what you do. Mm. And then I said to him, you're the boss, but my S curve is plateauing. I, I did everything that was creative in this role. If you ask me to continue to do this, I think that my differentiator ends up as a commodity. It will become a qualifier. So I will serve you because you want me to do this. But, but let us be adults that in two, three years, at last, I, either I change or you change or we change, but I cannot, ultimately, I cannot keep repeating what I have done. Um, and, and that is something in general that I wish for all people that they regularly watch not only the S-curve of a company or the S-curve of a function or a team, but also their own S-curve. 
there are steps in life. I, I found, uh, the older I got, the better I could see this, that you have to refresh yourself and to make these steps. But the answer to your question, no, it didn't go always smoothly. <laughs> these, these, are, these are very meaningful things. Uh, the, the, the topics and what you just described is something that we cover in, um, in some of the trainings that, that, that I work with, uh, that I work on with people, where one of the sections is just how do you influence stakeholders? How do you have difficult conversations? One of these conversations is, hey, I, 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 I'm not growing or I'm not going where I want to go or yes, I'm going to do what you're asking me, but, and I, I think that what you just described is a very cool example of those principles. And I agree with you that you need to have those conversations because I believe that everybody's going to run into a snag or into a situation where they're being pigeonholed into a type of role or where they're just penalized by the good work they do, right? I, I know that earlier on my career, I was very good at, at, uh, at cost accounting and I, I just couldn't get promoted out of that job because people were afraid that if they moved me, there was gonna be a problem. So you need to be able to speak to, to, to your point. I, I appreciate your, your anecdote. It, as, and, uh, as that happened, but, huh? yeah, go ahead. Sorry, please do well. No, no, go, go, you go. Um, no, what, what, because I, uh, well, at least I saw some people signed up that know me for long or know me from the past. One thing now that I'm turning uh, 62, I'm proud of is in my action of belly as, as a CPO, we at a certain moment had really a beautiful global year. We, I think we had a thousand people in procurement, uh, 270 production size in 80 countries, a beautiful kaleidoscopic mix of people that today's diversity dreams would be jealous of. And, and, and there were at least 30 potential executives that were really worth investing time and effort in. And we decided to go to the Spanish Pyrenees with such a group for a full week. And we did rafting and we did mountain climbing. I was 46 or 47 then. Um, but we invested time with each other. And one of the assignments with an external coach present, who I also still uh, have a good friendship with, he said, Tom, do you have the guts to discuss or to share in front of these 30 people all the, hot, the highlights and the lowlights of your life? So you have to, to see this, that 30 people are sitting in the grass in the Pyrenees. And then I told them my high and my lowlights but also real low lights uh, about our first daughter that we lost. And then I said, you saw now an emotional man, but I will laugh again in five minutes. But if you walk in pairs of two and you share with each other your lives, then realize please that the more you give, the more you will get back. You will learn most from each other if you really have the character to share the things that hurt. And that group became a very close group. And that was, that is now really long ago. Most people are now over 50, but many of them are at the current sea level jobs. And at least with seven out of those 30, I'm still talking. And we still talk about how we became a very close, close group. Now, the next point I want to make is this was, of course, you invest in and with people and, and you do this equally without ranks. But another thing was I've tried in those years to tell them where my integrity was. And, I've, and I think that people really that are either sitting in an executive committee or are reporting to it, and I had the privilege to be in the last 20 years, always a direct report to a management board or an executive committee. And most of the time I sat in those meetings without having the title. But I promised a certain integrity to people in the Pyrenees. And I've since seen later that I am a very, I, I, I'm not the man that loves, that, 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 that not, not loves is the wrong word, but I'm not the person that, that emotionally is well positioned 
to rationalize a company, to send a lot of people home, to make all those families without a job, uh, or to make a certain kill uh, just for the for the ratio on the balance sheet, or just for the bonus of executives. So that, that, that has come also a point in life that I had to realize with my personality, for instance, I'm not an M&A raider. I'm not a man that you should send in to a pure investment company that wants to, to optimize the assets and then move on. I'm ultimately more interested in the purpose of a company, the purpose of people, the purpose of, a, of certain businesses, but I'm not in the, in the, in the, in, in, yeah, in the money making. But that had to do with, call it the personality that you become or the person that you tell your people, yeah, the, the, the person that you are. So it, 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 uh, uh, it, 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 that is what I want to share with people. It takes a certain robustness to be in the heart of the corporate world. And you have to realize this when you say yes to these jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think that that's so important that you have clarity over what you want to do, what you don't want to do, and, uh, and where you want to go and, and not. And so I have a, uh, a related question to that. As, as your career evolved and as you were going through these realizations, was there ever a time, maybe the answer is no, but, but did it ever occur to you I'm going to end up being the CPO for my company, being a C-level executive. I want to do that. That's my ambition. Again, or, and I'm talking about as your career evolved, because we already established from the beginning, early on, you didn't see yourself, you didn't aspire to the executive suite as such, it happened. But as you progressed, was there a time where you said, actually, this is where I'm heading. I want to be there. or or no? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, yes and no. Uh, I think the, the core story is that I never developed a certain plan. Um, but when they had seen me uh, in DSM pioneering in Chile and building a global business out of this that fitted the core of DSM, then at a certain moment, they asked me to build that internet. So when I said, well, could you not find somebody else with the right IT background or the, whatever? No, we think you have convincing capabilities to talk to business people in the year 1999, 2000, that you see the logic of internet technology and convince the people that have grown up without them that they can both on the buy and the sell sites can start looking at what you can do with publish, with connectivity with everything, which today is very normal. So, and I, I found out that after six months of sweating in IT, that the rest became business process redesign. Then I was back in my natural habitat. But then they said, oh, can you join us to Switzerland because we are going to acquire Roche Vitamins and could you be integrating procurement and some of supply chain? There was 2 billion out of 3 billion acquisition. And then I found out I became part of a huge transformation. But in reality, I thought that I more or less was pulling it off. And then my esteem, my self-esteem was growing. Oh, I, I can be, I can be a C-level person. What, whatever the name is, I can pull it off. I saw, I learned then also the whole way of methodical working of the McKinsey's because they were in those days our, our partner. Hmm. And then it is weird. I got the smell in the nose that not I, but somebody that they would hire from abroad, from outside, would get the formal position of the CPO of the Rush Vitamins or DSM nutritional products. And without that, I really was talking to, to search firms via connections that I had, I got the question, are you willing to talk to Axon or well? So out of the blue, I, I was looking into a fresh CEO and a CFO in Axon Nobel, and they said, we have been told that you could be our first CPO because we never had one. Long story short, I became their first CPO. So I got a spend of 10 billion where the company DSM that I had served for 20 years didn't think I could run 2 billion. Yeah, that was a weird move um, because 
you, you felt somewhere frustrated. You didn't get what you th thought you had deserved in your first multinational that you served for 20 years. And then you get the possibility in the other Dutch chemical industry uh, at, a, at a much bigger position where everything still had to be shaped. Um, but did I invent all of this? No, it, 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 it came on my path. Uh, and at a certain moment, I, I was 45 when Axel Nobel came. I, I, I now can say most men in those years are silverback gorillas. They are mature. They want to show that they are having all these masculine qualities. So if somebody <laughs> says, would you, would you be willing to jump on this wagon? Yeah, I, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you didn't. Uh, uh, we were going to get to that, but I think that your interests are, are pretty beneficial to humanity. And, and I'm glad that you could get to where you got given your interest. But before we get there, so I, I know that we learn through mistakes. If I look back my own career, I made a bunch uh, of mistakes and we're never free for them. Is, is there any mistake that you made that was painful, but that helped you grow? Is there any, any mistake that you can share that happened along your career? And maybe when it happened, it was painful. But now you look back and it's like, oh, I'm actually happy that happened because I learned a lot. Yeah. I think so far I have been talking about a... Uh, kind of roadmap or a kind of career, uh, a working life that is uh, uh, pretty nice. But I think with the character that goes with it, uh, uh, you put a lot of the spotlight on the, on, the, on the better half of me. But there is, of course, also a dominant leader in me or a person that wants to work harder, longer and faster than your colleagues. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that I have also been now and then uh, uh, been, been bruce, bruising or uh, been brusque uh, to, to people around me. Uh, people that know me know that I care a lot about people, that I always want to follow up, that I try to take care of people even if, when I'm gone. But it is also fair to say that sometimes, uh, also in my position, uh, yeah, you, you fall, yeah, so to speak, you run over people because you need to achieve certain goals. Uh, end of the day, I've not always been a pussycat or something. Uh, I'm quite goal oriented, number oriented, result oriented, and, and with only talking uh, friendly, it doesn't work either. Um, I, I, I agree. I, 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 yeah, and I think uh, that happens as well in the corporate world. There are always good years in the corporate world and less good years. Um, and I've seen in all three multinationals that 20, 30 percent of the time you spend in such a company, you later say, I, I should not have been there anymore. I should have done something uh, I'm, uh, uh, that I also can, uh, can admit. Thank you, for, thank you for sharing that, Ton. How about mentors? As you were growing up, who, who can you share? Did you have somebody who was uh, invested in you, who believed in you, who gave you guidance, support, who helped you think through opportunities or problems. Can you share um, about who you're most? I think that there, then, 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 then there are several people. It starts with your parents, of course. Um, I already quoted my mom, but she was an absolutely uh, caretaking and loving mother. But she comes from a family where they put some stamina into a person. Uh, rightfully so. My father, um, in those days, this was uh, uh, happening in the Netherlands, was the youngest of a family, and they asked him to become a priest student. Uh, so he was only a few weeks away when he was mid-20s to become formally a priest, and then he stepped out of the system, and he became a father, otherwise you would not be talking to me. But of course, I had an education, and I grew up with a very caring man, uh, endless walks in the weekend or in the evenings, talking about life, about the afterlife, the beauty of nature, uh, the well the, the well-being that you can do with people. And he was not a hard-nosed business guy, of course. He was leading a different life. 
And the older you get, the more that you remember and recall all the lessons learned. And I think, although I couldn't express this when I was younger, that often in the way you decide and the way you behave, they're, they're your DNA. If I'm becoming more formalistic, um, my mentor as a legal counsel, who I still, st and I still visit him, he's 78 now, also a Ton, Ton van der Put. Yeah, he was a true mentor, both in the quality of the contract making, but also in showing the mentality what it takes to make a deal, uh, to lead negotiations. Um, and a few times in your life, you meet those people. If I look in the CPO world, there are a few people that I, that I really admire for what they do. If I look at the moment of the CPO of Bayer, I met him in 2008, I think for the first time, he is a stayer. Uh, Thomas Udesen is also very, very focused, not only on the business side of what he does, but also on developing sustainability, developing organizations and network organizations where other companies and people can join. And he does this because he wants to, to contribute. I've worked a lot. Uh, and spoken a lot in the past with Mark Engel, who was a CPO and also the COO of Unilever, and how he would groom his organization to make suppliers winning partners instead of suppliers. So to develop new taste and answers, to develop new features of the products that Unilever was selling. Instead of developing it itself, he worked very closely together in partnerships. He was convinced already in the years that he was leading with Paul Polman, uh, the former CEO, that sustainability should be in the heart of the company, that sustainability was business. Um, so it happens some, yeah, several, several times. And, and one, I don't want to forget, that's the last one. He is now also, I think, 70. But even as a legal counsel, I was allowed to work with him. He was a very young professor, the head of research. He was tripling jobs almost. And he was the leading biochemist in DSM, Amomea. But he, when he was 40-ish, I think, <clears throat> spoke already about mentoring. And he had, he then also said, Tom, in the, in the board of management of DSM, a few that I know still have a mentor. And he said, you can, you, you do with it what you want. But I have this, I have the belief that even if you turn 60 and older, you, st you still can benefit from a mentor. And, and I, and I had, I, I still have a few persons where I go to, to try to improve who I am now and then, uh, and to, to, and this is, of course, your best mentor is, 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 is my wife, but sometimes I, I love to hear it from somebody else who can say it more straight in my face or wants to say it more straight in my face. So there's lifetime mentorship. Yeah, I truly believe it. Uh, absolutely, I, I I cannot disagree with anything you said. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. Ton, another question in in regards to your teams. So when you develop people, when you promoted people, when you decided who would go faster than the rest, what were you looking for? What were those traits that you saw in people that you thought here's the new leader for the future? Now, if I may correct a little bit, and <clears throat> if you if you have the privilege to look at many people, you only you do not only look at leaders of the future. You can also look at specialists for the future or other unique characters. But I think you you look to a mix of you yeah you need a certain brightness, you need a certain intelligence, but you also need perseverance. You also need to have the capability that your battery is charged every day again, even after a tough day. You need a, a, a good doses of humor. You need, although targets can be absolute and things can be black and white, but to, to put a relative remark to things is also important. So you need, you need a mixed bag of ingredients. Um, and another element is that you, commit, that you deliver what you promise. And if you say that for three months in a row at six in the morning, you start, then you do it. And you don't say, yeah, half the week I don't, and now I was sick, and now I have a headache. Um, I, th I think you need a certain perseverance, a certain rigor, 
to get things done. But it is in this combination and people that are anxious to learn. Because there is a saying, the more you know, the more you know how little you know. <laughs> and I'm no, always a little bit afraid if people start saying, I've seen it all, I'm a doctor in something, I'm even a professor in something, I'm a senior partner in something, yeah, fantastic. But then you should know even better how much more there is around. Uh, so people with an open mindset, people with this curiosity constantly to learn. Um, yeah, that is. I, I, we we once had a had a, the number one of HR in DSM, but he also had been running NAFTA crackers. But he was a lawyer by origin. So mm. when they asked him, "How did you end up at those positions?" He said, "Oh, so simple. I'm curious. I'm always curious in new things and in people. That seems to be the the key to many things." And then he smiled a little bit. But I think it's to, nowadays a mix of these things together that you look for in people. That's fantastic. So Tom, before we move to the personal side of it, which, which I'm very interested in, in going into, maybe the last career development type of question that I would like to get your thoughts on is knowing there's a lot, what would be the top three or the top five things you would recommend to people in the audience to focus on, to grow their careers, to stand out, to be different from the rest, be not a commodity, like you said, but be well differentiated in a way that would be good for their growth. What would be your top three, top five? Well, these questions sound so simple, but they're not. Huh? Yeah, one is stay to your core. And sometimes somebody has to tell you what your core is, but your core is, for instance, what you take for granted. So somebody else will say how special you are in solving problems. Or somebody else will say your caring character for people is, oh, is fantastic. Then you can think you're that's normal. No, that is for, it's a talent you have. And, and your talent you should nurture. Um, another thing is this integrity that I discussed about. Please don't yeah, try to sell your, your personality because of a career step or a stupid bonus or something. Stay who you are. Uh, the third thing is you can work, I don't say 24 hours, but you can, you can be endlessly active in something that is your passion area. So you, you should, uh, and we all have things to do in life that are not our passion, but try, try to find the areas where you just already jump out of bed in the morning for joy, then, then, then it is much easier to outperform in anything you want. Uh, if you do things with a grudge, yeah, the six out of 10 is almost a guarantee. Um, and then, but I think I've told in the last almost an hour that, that I sometimes had the wrong background to do something. So you, be, you, you willfully have to be very dependent on other people. See that you get the best out of other people. And I think you get, get the best out of other people by giving also your best to the other mm -hmm. people. And people have an enormous antenna, whether you, you have given your own best to them, because they also read your, your character and who you are. So if people then all give the best they have, they can be a fantastic team. Thank you. That's so insightful. Thank you, Ton. So, so we have uh, like, like three minutes and I'm going to give them all to you. Um, just, just wanted to, before you know, we go there, again, thank the audience for joining. And I'm pretty sure that everybody's taking a bunch of notes and nodding and just finding meaning in what you're saying. And, and that's, um, those are things that we work in a very systematic way too in, in, the, in the trainings that, that I was referencing earlier that I work with people on. But it never means as much uh, until it really resonates from somebody's actual experience. And you've offered tons in this regard. So Ton, the, 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 last, the last three minutes are yours. Why, why sustainability? What does that mean to you? Why, why is that your passion? And, and how did that all coalesce into starting your own wine yard? No, that's a long, but I, but I want to start with something else. If I'm permitted, of course, you've asked, you've asked a lot. 
but as, as, as I think it's fair to say um, that we all have partners in life um, and nothing what I did, neither the traveling, uh, neither the education of our two children. It only works if you have an, an equally strong partner, but also a partner that is there in difficult moments and more or less takes care of a lot of the time that you're not at home. So in other words, in this case, uh, for me, my wife, Karen, has done this. Uh, and she often makes her role smaller, but it is the other way around. I can be full of confidence. I can jump around. I can make strange and long hours because everything is okay. If everything is not okay, you cannot do these things. Uh, so I want to have said that, that uh, uh, regardless who you partner has to be, but that but you do these things together. Uh, sustainability, yeah. The respect for nature or, or the beauty of the land came already from, from my parents, but walking with my father. But I think it just happened that DSM was an early adopter of people, planet, profit. It then turned out to be that product stewardship became ISO certification, and then it became uh, 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 rating agencies like Eco Partners and Dow Jones. DSM was good at it. Then I go to Axel Nobel, and the CEO that hired me says, I'm going to start a sustainability council. And by the way, I'm going to be number one. So I will beat DSM. Healthy competition. So AXO became number one in the Dow Jones, very healthy for each other to keep each other on number one and two. Uh, I was part of a journey, but I was part of a journey where the CEO said, you diminish 10% CO2 in a tin of paint, you, 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 you create a positive uh, effect of the CO2 where the paint is applied on the ship or whatever. Um, and I believe that it will be business. So I had the privilege to grow up in, a, in an environment together with all the learnings in Solidaridad, that if you apply sustainability in a, in a, in a, in a, in a smart way, it, it, it gives you business or it gives you continuous improvement, it gives you efficiency, it gives you new product availability, new product features. It gives you the leadership position in value chains instead of being the legislation follower. Uh, it gives it gives you partnership opportunities. It gives you a different spirit and mentality that with the people that work with you, because it's much nicer to feel special than just to follow up on the last legislation that, uh, and, and just to try that you're hanging there with your hands on the roof. Let's hope we make it. It's much nicer to be a leader than a follower. Uh, so so step by step, sustainability became something for me where I saw constantly ways to, to, to differentiate what you do instead of doing the obvious qualifying job. And to finish that off, today, nowadays, uh, our newspapers are full of scope 3 CO2. Uh, and we need to understand our CO2 footprint. But the positive thing of it is, if I understand where I have the CO2 in my value chain, both with suppliers as well as with customers, I can change it. And if I change it, I'm looking for new business models. And the ones that are front runners with new business models create new margins. And with new margins, you get new business, profitability, excitement, innovation. So I can just go on. So, in, so instead of seeing all these things as partially hurdles, no, they are, they are opportunities. They are catalysts for new, for, for new things to happen. And that is why I believe that with sustainability, circularity, uh, thinking about a meaningful life uh, that's not soft, that is just bringing it into, into the heart of business transformation. Absolutely, absolutely. So Tom, unfortunately, I guess there's so much richness in what you just said today, we, we ran out of time. But uh, what I'd like to do is again, thank you for a very, very inspiring conversation. I think that many of the things that you just described, breathe life into, like I said, some of the things that we talk about in our trainings, but it's just so inspiring to hear where, where it all comes from, from your mom, from your dad, from your mentors, uh, the mistakes you make, the learnings that you had. And uh, I'm deeply grateful for your having spent the time with us and for sharing your experience. 
Uh, is there anything that you would like to say in closing, Tan, before we, we drop? Uh, I think we have discussed a lot, uh, serious thing, less serious things. It was for me a pleasure, but also a privilege that you invited me. If people uh, would have questions or want to contact or um, I'm open to these things, that is also part of when I'm allowed to do lectures and students want to follow up. Um, but I think with a with a small smile, would you not have been a fantastic neighbor in those days? We wouldn't have the interview today. So coming back to integrity and reputation and show, showing each other our genuine who we are is often uh, what, what what keeps us bonded, even if we are uh, at different parts parts uh, on our planet. So thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Ton. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who joined. I really appreciate you making the time and hopefully you got as much value out of this as I did. I wish everybody a fantastic day, fantastic evening, and I'll see you soon. We're working on some other very exciting conversations, just like the one we had with Ton, packed with learning, packed with excitement, packed with humanity. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Thank you, Ton. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you, Eduardo. Thank you all.